Hello again, it's John McGrady back with the third installment of the interview with the Famous Statistician series. And today it's an honor and a privilege to have Dr. Liz Storrett, who joined the faculty of Hopkins about six years ago after working at Mathematica Policy Research. And since coming to Hopkins, she has joint appointments in the Department of Mental Health and Biostatistics. And Liz does a lot of work in many interesting areas related to observational studies and causality. Uh, trying to figure out in situations that are less than optimal design-wise how to describe causality to interventions upon outcomes and also how to take studies that are done on uh, narrow subpopulations and extrapolate them to larger populations. So I want to welcome you to this session, Liz. Good to have you here. Thank you. So Liz, you've been active in both statistics and mental health research. Could you comment maybe on one or two major contributions to mental health and public health research in the past 10 years or so? Sure. Um, I think there's really two main areas that make mental health research particularly interesting for statisticians and have led to some really um, good advances both in this mental health science and statistics. One relates to latent variable methods and the fact that in mental health we often don't can't measure things directly. We can't, we don't have a direct measure for schizophrenia or depression. And actually, I'll just, not to interrupt you, but Karen Van Dean Roach, who was here on our first interview, talked a little bit about the methods Liz is referring to here. Wonderful. I was hoping that, <laughs> that that was the case. Um, and so those methods, of course, are particularly relevant for mental health. And uh, there have been many studies that either, for example, uh, one I was involved in looked at trajectories, latent trajectories of children with autism and the ways that they develop over time and whether uh, di there are different groups of kids in terms of their sort of growth over time in these latent, latent measures. Um, another example looks at interventions and whether different interventions have, have different effects on different types of people. For example, there are some where they show that kids who have um, trajectories of high aggression sort of have particularly big intervention effects and that these programs can really help lower their aggression levels. Excellent. Um, another uh, example where mental health has really sort of made statistical and, and sort of scientific contributions is in cluster randomized trials. So um, a lot of mental health um, interventions are what are called preventive interventions, and so they're aimed to operate across a broad a whole spectrum of individuals, um, for example, school-based preventive interventions. And so the challenge there, of course, is you can't randomize individuals. All the kids in the school get the same program. Um, and so there's statistical challenges in um, how, to how to design and analyze those sorts of studies. Excellent. So you've sort of alluded to this in some of your discussion here, but what do you see as some of the notable opportunities for statistics and biostatistics as it relates to mental health and other areas in, in the next 10 years or so? Yep, I think um, the cluster randomized trials is a, is a big area. Um, in fact, today the National Institute of Mental Health in, um, announced a new suicide prevention mm -hmm. strategy for the country. And with suicide prevention, similarly, you, you can't, you don't know the people who are really at highest risk, and so they tend to be more of these universal prevention programs. Um, and two other examples I sort of have particular interest in, one is comparative effectiveness, which is a, a sort of hot topic. That's a hot topic for In sure. general, um, and relevant for mental health as well as other conditions, and there's you know, huge data, electronic health records, I'm sure you'll be talking <laughs> about <laughs> yeah. some of those issues. Um, another area that I think is maybe less known in the public health world, um, and is sort of moving more from my time in public policy at Mathematica, is um, the government is trying to use more, to learn more about how they roll out programs. So for example, rather than rolling out a new educational program nationwide, you know, if we, if we do it in a smart way, we can learn more about the effects of that program. For example, do it in a random subset of states first. And you can then use that to actually look at the effects. Um, and I think, so far, not a lot of statisticians have been involved in those discussions and how we can make, make better public policy um, using smart design choices and stuff. Um, but I think that could be a really exciting area for statisticians to be involved. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. I'm excited about those opportunities. So, so uh, we're here you know, in the context of the statistical reading series. And the series, while well, it only covers two quarters, it, it sort of attempts to highlight the foundations of statistical thinking and practice. And while the course is, you know, in, we, in two quarters we can only give an introduction, but we do cover a lot of territory. Can you maybe comment based on, uh, on how important sort of the basics of statistics are, exploratory data analysis, inference and estimation, of course adjustment in non-randomized scenarios, and linear models. You know, how important they are in public health research, both as important tools under their own, but perhaps also as building blocks for sort of the more advanced methodology that you do. Sure, yeah, I think uh, they're really crucial. There's, 
one way I think about it is that sometimes students will come, or, or anyone, you see some analysis, and it's some really fancy model, and they've put some big Bayesian framework <laughs> on things. Right. But I sort of want to know, well, what does, the what does just the data tell us? You know, the big models and the, the big methods really rely on a lot of assumptions. And I'd like to see sort of, well, what is the basic data telling me? You know, just some pr through exploratory stuff, through some simple regressions, do we at least see a similar pattern? Um, and I don't, I just sort of, it gives me a little more faith in the bigger, sort of fancier models. Um, the other thing I often tell students when they take my class is a lot of what we talk about, and we'll talk more about this probably, um, with confounding and sort of doing that is we basically use regression. So right. there are some very simple descriptives that you can do to get a sense for how much you really should trust, say, a study that was non-randomized. Excellent. So as, as I noted in the introduction, you've made many contributions building on this idea of regression. Uh, you've made many contributions to statistical methodologies of causal inference. Um, can you briefly describe the goal of causal inference? I know it's broader than just observational studies, but just to start, can you sort of reiterate the goal with respect to observational studies? Sure. So the goal, as you've alluded, is we want to say what is the impact of some program or um, policy or maybe a risk factor. So some examples um, that I know of in the literature are, you know, what is the effect of heavy adolescent drug use on adult outcomes? Um, what is the effect of virginity pledges on um, later sexual behavior? Um, what is the effect of joining a gang on, on later violence levels and arrest records? All of these examples are ones where you generally can't randomize. You know, we're clearly not going to randomize people to be a heavy drug user right, or, or not an adolescent or, or join a gang. <laughs> right. um, and so causal inference methods aim to get the best estimates of the impacts of those things as possible. Um, Randomized trials have this have the benefit that what happens is because of the randomization, the say gang joiners and non-gang joiners are equivalent on everything else. So if you see some difference in the outcomes, you know it's because of the gang and not because of Other the fact that they were more aggressive to start with or things like that. Um, and so a lot of causal inference methods, you can think of them as basically trying to replicate some of the features of the randomized experiment. Excellent. So in this course, speaking of that, in a non-randomized situation, we, we certainly spend a fair amount of time uh, talking about confounding. And uh, we show you know, how to adjust to outcome exposure associations for potential confounding variables, you know, both using stratification and then actually multivariate regression models, which are just another form of intense stratification in some ways. Um, so for example, you know, kind of building on what you said, if we were trying to isolate the association between the risk of contracting HIV among people who were not HIV positive and participation in some sort of needle exchange program, we would like to adjust for as many factors as we can using regression to isolate, if you will, the impact the, of the needle exchange program. So we might run you know, a multivariable model that includes any adjustment variables we may have measured that are potentially related to the outcome and the exposure, you know, age, sex, smoking history, uh, other risk-taking behaviors, et cetera. And this method, you know, it works well in a, for a small number of such variables, but of course confounding is a complicated, multifaceted thing. So what, you know, what are some of the potential limitations of taking such approach, and how have the work you've done sort of improved upon that? The, the main limitation, um, the way I sort of often think about it, is relates back to my high school, I think, geometry or algebra class, mm -hmm. where we learned about interpolation and extrapolation. Um, and the, the main danger is extrapolating, is making out-of-sample predictions. Mm -hmm. So a traditional multivariate regression adjustment in this context will just sort of assume that that linear model or whatever model you're fitting extrapolates from one group to the other. Um, in reality, though, if your groups are very different, um, if they have very different smoking behaviors, if they have uh, different age distributions, different um, drug abuse history, that really might be based on extrapolation. So the mm. groups you're trying to compare um, may just really be very different from one another and in a way that makes that regression not trustworthy. Uh, the other sort of catchphrase I rem you know, that you sort of learn, again, I learned I think in high school math class, was the world is locally linear. So we might believe that linear regression if the groups look pretty similar to one another, if there's only sort of small differences between them. But in cases, in a lot of non-experimental studies, your sort of treatment and comparison groups are really quite different on some of these background characteristics. And that's when these more sophisticated methods can be really useful, um, rely less on the model assumptions. 
All right, so with respect to some of the things you were talking about in the last discussion, you know, one method for potentially improving adjustments over the sort of linear module, the model approach that we start to develop in this class is, is using something called propensity scores. Um, can you briefly explain the idea of propensity scores and how these can be employed to adjust outcome exposure relationships in the presence of many, and perhaps a key word here is measured potential variables, potential confounders? Sure. The propensity score itself is defined as the probability of receiving the, the treatment or exposure or program of interest. Um, and it is actually very simple. The, the main methods don't even require fancy methods necessarily. So usually involves fitting a logistic regression of program as a function or treatment as a function of, the, of these characteristics. Um, each person then, you get the predicted probability for each person. So each person then has a propensity score. So their probability of being treated. Okay. Um, the sort of intuition behind that is then that if a group of people have similar propensity scores, that implies that they all had a similar probability of being treated. So let's say you and I each had, say, a propensity score of 0.5. Then maybe you ended up treated and I did not. That must have just been random. The fact that you got treated and I didn't was sort of a random chance because we both had the same probability. So then we could compare our outcomes, and it's like we've created a sort of mini randomized experiment. So if you have many people, you can compare people with similar propensity scores, and the idea is that you've sort of recreated a randomized experiment within these small ranges. Analytically, yeah. Um, the, the catch, the important sort of catch is, you know, there is, there's nothing magic about propensity scores in that they can't control for the unobserved things. Sure. So um, there may be unobserved differences between you and I, which led you to get the treatment and me not. Um, but we can, if we sort of hold that for now, we can at least make sure that you and I, our, our groups, our treatment and comparison groups, look similar on the observed characteristics. So it's sort of like doing the best you can with what data you have at hand. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate your coming out to talk to us today, and I'm sure the students do. And I uh, hope you'll think about this in our discussions of camp founding and perhaps in your further work in biostatistics. And we'll look forward to coming back with our next speaker. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. It was a pleasure.